Hey everyone, you're listening to the Vent Podcast, your source for market insights, wine industry news, and updates on our current collections. Enjoy the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Vent Podcast. My name is Brady. I'm joined as always by Billy. And as of today, the day that we're recording yesterday was National Wine Day. And I guess we're a bad wine investment company because we celebrated by launching a Scotch whiskey collection. Our Macallan, our Macallan 50 year Macallan uh, whiskey bottle collection launched yesterday and sold out in less than eight hours. It was a $115,000 collection. And we were selling that collection for $20 a share. We had a lot of new investors get in on this offering. And of course, a lot of seasoned Vint investors and folks were really excited for a long time about more whiskey offerings from us. So we were glad to provide that once again. And we'll have lots more in the future if you missed out on this one. But Billy, did anything surprise you about this whiskey offering compared to some of our previous ones? Well, first, in our defense, McAllen's are known for being finished in sherry barrels. So technically, it still has a wine related theme. <laughs> <That's right. so. laughs> yeah, we, um, missed, we missed all that messaging. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, wait, we we were on point for, for sure. No, I, I was just excited to be able to offer another whiskey collection. I was telling the team that our our two bottles of McAllen Fine and Rare last year took longer to sell than this the single bottle of 50 year the McAllen we had this year. And that just goes to kind of note how much our community gr- has grown and how much interest there is in the in the spirit space nowadays. So I was excited there. I didn't really know how fast this one would sell as it's our first single bottle whiskey collection. It's a great bottle and I understand why, why it went quickly. And we had a a lot of people ask, um, I had had a lot of conversations recently about the format of our collections, you know, because sometimes we offer collections that are hundreds of bottles, multiple different producers in cases. And then, you know, with whiskey, we've typically just had some sets, obviously the McAllen Finding Rare, we had two, just two single bottles that was back earlier, like middle, early, middle of 2021. And now the single bottle, it's kind of unique to come on and, and the, the sticker value can be a little bit shocking when you see one bottle of whiskey, you know, with kind of a market price of 115,000 as we have it listed on our platform. But there were only, was it 200 bottles produced out of the barrel? Yeah, for for this bottling, which is lower than a bunch of their other single barrel bottlings, especially at this age. But I, I think, you know, over the past 20 plus years, scotch has become such an investable asset class or single malt whiskey, including Japanese as well. So with, while this price tag seems shocking for most now, they're the records have been shattered over and over what single bottles of whiskey records are. So, I mean, now they're in the the 400,000, 500,000, even up to, you know, some obscure cases are they go a lot higher, closer to a million per bottle. So while it seems strange, I, I think when people are thinking about our collections in general, you just have to think about how the assets are typically bought and sold and on more of an investor market. And when it comes to wines, unless it's like DRC or some of the higher end stuff, there are people are mostly buying cases, you know, three, six, 12. So in order to be able to diversify our collections across different producers, sometimes it, it, it necessitates us having to, you know, buy a number of bottles. Whereas when in the whiskey space, you know, these bottles alone are so um, sought after and they're made in such limited quantities that that's why we're able to do some of these collections that are just so few bottles. So it's just really the nature of the asset class. And I, I, I read in the investment thesis, I don't know if we had talked about this offline, or not, but was it th- about 30 bottles that were allocated to the U.S. on distribution? Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, it was so, a, a little more than that, maybe like 35, okay. but yeah. yeah. So like th- three, dozen, three dozen total bottles came to the U.S. Did we acquire this bottle outside of the U.S. or in the U.S.? Like, did we kind of add to that share or how did that work? We acquired it outside of the U.S. Outside so of the U.S., okay. If we were to sell it in the U.S. market, we would be adding to, you know, that that limited yeah. quantity, 30 or well, 35, whatever it was. Either way, it's still really, really low quantities um, anywhere, any way you shake it out. Even if it was 200 bottles just in the US, that would be you know, a super low amount. But 200 produced globally, only a couple dozen came to the US originally. And so we're excited to offer that investment to our investors um, wherever they're coming from. 
Yeah. Yeah. And if you think about it this way too, it's, you know, there's certain, you, you have to know someone or have an allocation or a connection to get one of those, you know, 30 plus bottles that made it to the US in the first place. Right, right. People purchasing at this stage, you know, kind of have global connections, but the ability that we have now is to sell this bottle into any market throughout the world. So if there is somebody in the US who is down the line, like, oh man, I, I missed that initial sale. I really want one. Where can I find one? You know, that's that's something where we can kind of play this arbitrage of, you know, we acquired it um, overseas and we're able to sell it, you know, in the US, you know, potentially down the line for more money. So that, that's part of the the beauty of being able to buy and hold wine in the UK and overseas in general and have the optionality to sell across markets. Yeah, that's a great point. And we'll have more uh, and more whiskey offerings and more diverse whiskey offerings, especially as as we go forward and, and into the summer and towards the end of this year. I know we're looking into other categories as well. And we get people all the time asking about other categories of spirits, um, including rum and tequila. Right now, I think we're exploring some other whiskey markets as well because we've done scotch and Japanese whiskey, but we do have more coming down the pipeline. That's right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. No, we we have we're lurking on finalizing some now. And our main goal is just getting, you know, that that top tier blue chip asset that has mm-hmm. some liquidity. That we, we're always looking to make sure that there's a market to, you know, exit these bottles eventually. So in in the in a collector level. So while there's some things like tequila and, and rum that have nuanced followings and some of them, you know, definitely go for a lot of money. We're making sure that we're able to, you know, have a, a, an investment for investors that's, you know, has a market, you know, has a track record of sales so that we're, we're able to provide, you know, a, a good forefront, I guess, looking forward of these collections yeah. for investors. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Let's, Let's pivot a little bit here and discuss, I think you have an update on the Bordeaux on Primor process that you and the wine team are going through right now. Do you want to share some of the updates on how that process has been and what kinds of offerings we have coming to the Vit investors in the future? Yeah. So as I, as I mentioned, I went and we, we did the tasting in April and then the way the cadence mentioned goes, as I mentioned last week is they start the wines start being released um, by the different chateau, um, kind of staggered throughout the month of May and into June. So we've been seeing some of these releases, and the key thing that everybody looks for each year is what is the price this year compared to the release last year, taking into account the vintage quality, the quantity of wine produced, and all these other variables. For for a while in Bordeaux, after the 2010 and 2011 Ampremer season, or I guess. Yeah, the, the, those seasons, the two that when the 2009s and 2010s were released, basically on promo prices really kind of started skyrocketing in general. So while there was some fluctuation year to year, taking into account vintages, they were generally higher and higher as time went on. So what was interesting, as we mentioned before, is 2019 saw when the 2019s were released in 2020, thanks to the pandemic, we saw a bit of a reset and then prices continued to climb last year. And then, so this year, everybody was looking, you know, are these wines going to be continued to be marked up? Are they going to be about the same? Are they going to be a little lower? And so far what we're seeing, which has been a positive sign since the vintage was challenging, there were some great wines made, some other wines, you know, didn't show quite as well. And we're seeing wines coming out at about the same as last year. Some are a little lower, some are just a little higher. And what this means is, you know, the, the Bordelais kind of have taken into account the quality of the vintage overall. Sometimes, you know, some of the wines had struggled, but I think overall the quantity was just down. Some of the frost that hit their producers producing 30% less than they did last year. I think uh, I can double check which one it was that actually put that as part of their sales pitch. But I, I think it was something like Palmer and maybe another producer basically saying, you know, our prices are about the same as last year, but we made 30% less wine. So, you know, we're just trying to, you know, economically make sense here. So it's interesting. Some of the big guys that have released so far are Cheval Blanc, Angelus, Palmer, Ponte Canet, along with a handful of of, of others. We're still waiting for the first growth to come out and kind of some of the the bigger boys, the biggest boys. But yeah, it's been a good year so far in terms of prices not skyrocketing again. So we're we're being very judicious and, and snagging our allocations here and there where we can and hopefully putting together a, a good basket for our investors. Yeah, it's awesome. I know a lot of people have been 
looking forward to our Bordeaux Entrepreneur offering since we had it last year in 2021. This will definitely be a more robust offering representing more producers, right? I think than we had than we had last year. So I think we're really excited about it. And it's great to be able to offer our future so easily to our investors. Yeah. And I, I think the the key thing is this year we're we're taking I mean just like last year, but we're going through with you know in a in a vintage like 2021 where not everyone's producing amazing wines, but there are some really great wines to be found. It just takes a little bit of, of time and discretion and analyzing the that value ratio. And I think we're we're doing a great job at, at getting wines at good prices. And yeah, no, we're excited. Well, we might even, you know, depending on how much we're able to get allocations where we might even have two on premier collections this year. Who knows? So yeah, it's it's been an exciting couple of weeks. It's it's kind of like every day you just wake up to see who released what and at what price. It's almost like a, a little Christmas every day. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's great. It's great to be the buyers right now when especially when so many other asset classes are are struggling, but the wine has been doing really well and there's still producers making excellent wine every year. So it's it's a good place to be in for us. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Do we want to pivot into something maybe a little bit more fun and light? We can discuss some of our Memorial Day picks for wines to pair with your Memorial Day barbecues. I know we missed National Wine Day, but we can celebrate at least a little bit of wine this weekend and give you something else to pair with your barbecue feast. Yeah. So this, what we're going to try to dive into here is a little different format than we've done in the past, but we're just going to both list our top three wines and we're going to take ter- for, for top three wines for cookouts barbecues what have you and brady and i are going to take turns so we'll, one of us will go first next one will go next so that way you know even if one of our wines are taken we have backup so brady do you want to kick it off with what your your top wine for a cookout might be so i'm just i'm looking at my list right now and i realized that i've been snubbing red wines for a while recently <laughs> when i when i make lists or recommendations for folks but I'm really big on like, especially these cookouts, the, you know, the side salads and slaws and the vinegary dressings and things like that. And it just made me think about like drier, acidic, uh, white wines. And so I, I brought to mind like an old world shard, maybe a Chablis to pair, you know, you're not going to eat it right alongside your barbecue dripping ribs. But I think, especially if it's a little bit warmer this weekend, really chill it down. And that would, that would be a great pick for me. Hmm. That's an interesting choice. I could, I could see that. And that um, even like um, something Especially, a little bit more you know, who could sit up to like a burger. Yeah. And I think what, what brought it to mind chicken. for me was because I tend to think about like seafood, you know, I'm over here on the East coast in the Atlantic, like the Maryland Chesapeake Bay area. And, you know, having seafood at Memorial day, like certainly isn't out, out, out of the question. So I think, you know, something like a Chablis, you know, a white, maybe even like not, not including a lot of the oak. I, I guess I'm just thinking less along the lines of the traditional barbecue feast and thinking about more of what I'll probably be eating. I think that like more of an unoaked shard would be something up my alley for this weekend. Hmm. All right. So Brady's, are we, are we doing this top down or bottom up? Is that your number three or your number one? Oh, I didn't really rank them, but I don't think that's my number one. I mean, yeah, I, I think that's a little bit more just like what I was feeling <laughs> right now. Do you want me to do the other two or do you want to go back and forth? Now let's let's go back and forth. Okay, go ahead. All right. If we're we're going not necessarily in order, I'll just start with one here. We'll be um now this is where I was I was mentioning to you offline that I was I was trying to get a little too specific. So I'm just gonna say sparkling wine in general is my my first choice here. But in particular, and and I can talk about why sparkling would be great for all types, but then in particular, I'm thinking red sparkling wine. This is mainly because I happened to when I was in um, Australia doing my vintage. I was introduced to a lot of a lot of barbecues. Yes, they they did throw a shrimp on the barbie. Uh, a lot of barbecues with sparkling red wine, <laughs> sparkling syrah, and there's a producer out here in um, Santa Barbara called Soul Miner that makes a really cool sparkling syrah. And I, I have a bottle that I'm going to bust out at a cookout where my buddy's smoking some meats this weekend. So that's top of mind, but. Anything like a, a good Lambrusco, um, you, you'll have to go to probably your total wine or somewhere nearby and actually ask for like a, you know, ask the worker for like a quote unquote good Lambrusco. So, cause I, I know over the years, there's a bunch of these like really fruity, just kind of sugary 
sparkly things you can get at the regular grocery store, I'd, I'd go a little deeper. But something about those is there is a little bit more body than a regular white wine, but there's still those bubbles that provides the acid. They tend to have maybe maybe a little touch of sweetness or perceived sweetness with the ripeness of the fruit. And that pairs really well with like a burger or ribs or, you know, even chicken. So that that's kind of my my go to. And, and then you know, regular sparkling, you can't go wrong either. The, those bubbles, it's almost just like the, the wine equivalent of a beer there. The bubbles and the acid will help cut through either, you know, fatty pulled pork or, you know, help you refreshing after some grilled chicken. So I think sparkling is way to go. And if you can get a good one, get a red sparkling. I think that uh, red sparkling shouldn't be allowed for this, this exercise. So that's kind of like a cheat code. So if you if you can if you can find a red sparkling at your at your local shop, then that's probably that's going to win <laughs> any any uh, Memorial Day cookout. Yeah, I had I had English sparkling or Oregon sparkling mainly just because I didn't want to say champagne, and I wanted something a little bit farther north. I mean, I know Oregon doesn't get there, but England does. So, anyways. Um, Okay, that's cool. Not my number two, but another one that I had, and you sort of mentioned it a little bit, thinking about like the ripeness of the fruit. I went with a Central Coast for California Syrah. I know the alcohol maybe gets a little bit higher in wines like that, so we'll see how hot it is outside this weekend, if, if that will be in play. But yeah, I love the Syrah standing up with some of those grilled meats. And I think going new world with it rather than old world going to give us a little bit more of that like riper fruit riper fruit quality that perceived sweetness that I think goes well with the typical like American style barbecue um, flavors that you get. So I really like that. We'll see how we'll see what the temperature temperature is and what ABV wines we can get out there. But if you can find a central coast Syrah around or under 14%, I think that would be a really good option. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. I'll, I'll actually say my, my number two, because it kind of goes around with, the same way. And it's kind of the traditional pairing that most, if you ask wine people, what they'll say with barbecue is um Zinfandel as well. It's kind of up the same, the same route. Yeah, yeah. Juicy, fruity. There's still a little bit of that acid underneath them, um, depending on where you get it from, or if you just get a really giant, you know, giant one from Dry Creek, there, there's still that for that fruit and this kind of the ripeness. The, the beauty of Zinfandel is that the bunches ripen unevenly. So even when you have some really ripe grapes within the bunch, you're still going to have some that are slightly underripe. So that gives it that little bit of sweet and sour kind of undertone flavor. And I think that it pairs is, is very similar to what you're saying with the Syrah from the Central Coast that would go well with, you know, any sort of like those, any meats from burgers, again, up to like even briskety with you get a little smokier with yeah. that. I, I think they both would work. And really, maybe well. I guess if you just went more like even more generally just to run Rhone blends and something maybe with a little bit higher dose of Viognier, you know what I mean? Um, just to add a little more brightness if you were doing like, a, you know, a blended wine. Yeah, so. no, I, I know where you're, I see where you're, I mean, even going to an Australian Shiraz, if we just want to say Syrah as a, sure. as a varietal, I think that could be a, an interesting, interesting way. But yeah, I, I definitely, I'm going to go a little more off the path and something I'd probably go a little bit more, but I, I've had a nice burger with a, a good juicy Zinfandel. I have mm-hmm. not had it. I have had it with a Shiraz, again, from Australia. So, I mean, I, I, I think both would work really well if you want to go in the red camp. All right, what's, what's your, your last one? Two? Oh, my last one? Oh, you said Zinfandel. Yeah. Okay. I, I went white again. I said like an off-dry Riesling from like Finger Lakes or something like that. I think you could probably find one with some effervescence, not necessarily sparkling, right? And that would, I think, hit all the notes for me. It would, I think the sweetness would give it a little bit more body maybe to stand up. But yeah, I was just, I was just kind of staying away from reds this weekend. I don't know if, if I'm um, just like on a kick right now, but you know, I, I, I thought that the little bit of residual sugar in like an off-dry thing would, would help to counterbalance a bit some of those heavier foods. Yeah, no, I think you're spot on. I had I had German Riesling further down, so I will I'll cross that off my list. But I think to your point, the little bit of residual, but also the, there tend to be lower ABV too, which makes it nice for, you know, yeah. you can have a, a couple refreshing glasses when you're out at your barbecue and not. Yeah, you know, and if you have it, balance. honestly, if, you know, especially with like an off-dry or even like a kind of like, like a semi-sweet, 
Riesling, like throw a few ice cubes in a solo cup and that's like just fine, <laughs> especially if it's low ABV. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I think a couple laterals to that too, that I was kind of thinking of could be like a Vino Verde oh, okay. from Portugal. Those are always number one, super cheap. You can probably yeah. get a, a good one for, you know, 10 bucks or less. Yeah. I um, say $7. Yeah. I, I know Virginia is a little, or uh, now Maryland is cheaper than out here in California. Um <laughs> or Los Angeles, at least. Yeah. And those tend to have that little bit of RS and a little bit of bubbles as well. I think that's, that's an under, underappreciated um, beverage that pairs with a lot of things. And then the other kind of even more obscure one is a Shakalina from like uh, the Basque country and um, kind of that, that area in Northern, Northwestern Spain. That's another low ABV kind of effervescent white wine, but I, I think you can't go wrong with that. I think that's a, a really good pick. And if the Trader Joe's near you sells alcohol, just go and buy, close your eyes and buy any rosé there and you'll be fine. <laughs> you'll have a wine wine under $15 and most people will like it when you bring it. So I also, the same goes with Vino Verde. That's hard to find a bad one. They're all, I mean, it's because they're simpler wines. So there's not, sure. it's not a lot to go wrong with it. <laughs> so my last one is a more broad category and I'm, just to, because I know you've had your first one recently. I'm just going to say orange wine in general, which is funny because there's a huge spectrum um, of what orange wine can be. So maybe ask your your wine shop person a little bit more. But what's interesting about these is you can tend to find them lower alcohol by volume. So again, refreshing. It can be nice and acidic, but they have a bit more body than a white wine. So they'll stand up you know, they pair really well with like the, the chickens or any of that type of stuff. You might have them on the on the grill, but can also stand up to red meat or pork. And then at the same time, some of them have this little in a nice way, herbal or like kind of phenolic note, this little bit more structure. They have almost like tannins um, and they have some of these herbal notes, some points that are really interesting and could pair well with like grilled corn or grilled broccoli or some of these things that are maybe vegetables that you're throwing on the grill as well, even some mushrooms. I, I think there's just a lot of, a lot of depth there, but I, I would again recommend asking, you know, your, your shop, your local wine store person, like, you know, what they recommend and then kind of telling them what you typically like to drink in a white wine or a red wine, and they can kind of direct you towards the proper one. Yeah. I think that's not another great one. Um, yeah. It covers, like you said, covers all the bases, but, between the different kinds of foods you might have because depending on where you live in the country, the spread could be extremely varied and orange wine. I mean, I'm just trying to think of something that would be totally off putting with it, but I think you could make it work um, for almost anything that you would have out at a picnic. Yeah. I don't think like, well, I was well, maybe, maybe like, Oh uh, yeah. I was going to say like uh, maybe like old Bay shrimp wouldn't be great, but no, I, I think that would actually work really well. I was thinking oh, more like, like I don't know. Ice cream in orange wine would be kind of horrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you chocolate, go, mint, mint chocolate chip ice cream in orange wine. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't see that going very well. Even like birthday cake would probably be kind of weird. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing, and it, it's a, it's a growing um, phenomenon. It's not really a phenomenon, but it's a style of wine that's becoming more and more accessible throughout the country. So I recommend going and checking it out plus plus they look cool in the glass and in the bottle they're always some great colors so you'll be sure to have something cool to show your friends and just as like maybe an encouragement right for for people who feel overwhelmed about what to bring to like a potluck picnic it can be just a really great opportunity to try a bunch of different kinds of foods with whatever wine you do bring so and you can kind of get a sense then firsthand of oh like this works with that i, I like you know the way this wine complements this food that i just it can be an opportunity to do some experimentation. So don't feel panicked. Agreed. And this is actually an interesting segue. We now have a email address at Vint that is just wine at Vint.co. So if you have any questions about wine, they get forwarded to me and, and the wine team um, about our, you know, about our collections this is what we created it for. But if you guys have any questions about pairing or wines to choose for the weekend, feel free to email us and, I will get back to you or anybody else on the wine team will get back to you. And with some recommendations or some tips, I, I love to to share ideas with people. So anytime anybody wants to chat wine, just shoot us an email at wine at vent.co. We'll be sure to respond. Awesome. 
Speaking of the wine team, Billy, we have an exciting announcement coming up. Do you want to tease that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So starting June 1st, we have a new member. That's why we are now referring to it as the wine team, but a new member of the, the Vint team that will be a really exciting addition to the wine team. I think everybody's going to be almost as excited as we are to have, have them join. But we're bringing on somebody with many years of experience and somebody with a lot of background and working with and acquiring the wines that we, we are buying and selling on a regular basis. So we're, we're really excited. We're not allowed quite yet to say who it is and we'll have them on the podcast as soon as they, they join, but yeah, stay tuned. We have some exciting news next week and we're excited to help accelerate everything we're doing at Vince. Basically we're going to put everything into like 3.0 mode with this addition to the team. So we're really pumped. Yeah, and between, between now and then, certainly check out our open collections on the site. We still have our white burgundy and our Germany collections. I know we've talked about our, I've been harping on white wines today. So drink white wines, go invest in white wines on our platform. And we still have those open collections and we will chat with you all next week. For questions, comments, or feedback on the Vent podcast, please email us at support at vent.co. To check out our current offerings and to sign up for the Vent platform, find us at www.vent.co. That's www.vint.co. Vint and VV Markets are offering securities pursuant to Regulation A. Our offering circular as amended can be found on the SEC website. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Investments such as those on the Vent platform are speculative and involve substantial risks to consider before investing. We may provide communication that may contain certain forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties. Information provided in any communications is not legal, business, or tax advice. All prospective investors should consult a legal, tax, or business advisor concerning the subject matter of any communications and any offering. 